Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I don't know Lifehouse Limuru is which church, but I come from Life Church International Limuru. Amen. I want us to declare these words of faith, and then we can have our seats and li listen to the word of God. Amen. Uh, all eyes closed and every head bowed down in reverence to the King of Glory. Father, we thank you for your word. It is indeed the very nature of life that was communicated to us when Christ was at the cross. We thank you for this life that we have in us that entrusts us to the hope that which you called us, that one day we too shall be translated into another kingdom. And I pray, O oh God, as I begin to open the pages of scripture, may their eyes begin to open that they may find illumination, enlightenment, and revelation in your word. That the same way, O oh God, you broke the bread as you sat with your disciples from a mouse and their eyes were opened. As we break this bread, may their eyes be opened that they may behold that which is the power of God that is communicated to us in Jesus' name. I said in Jesus' name. You guys can have your seats in heavenly places. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again. Uh, so before I, 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 I continue, I just want to uh, ask my wife to stand and wave from uh, there. That's my wife. Her name is uh, Purity, and we have one son called Nathaniel who cannot be here with us today. But I'm sure from wherever he is, he sends his greetings. Amen. My name is uh, Willie Minor. Uh, that's what the ID says, but uh, my, my friends call me Willie Professor, and I believe from today you guys will be my friends, so you can just call me Prof. Amen. I serve at Life Church International Imuru under uh, the leadership of Apostle Tim Wangi, and uh, together we also minister at uh, the Truth Mentorship Society or the Gathering of Champions, which is our Thursday interdenominational service at Kenya Cinema. Amen. So now, let's go to uh, our topic for today, or rather our excerpt from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We're going to specifically concentrate on verse 17 all the way to verse 24. But before I go and read the exact scripture that has already been uh, said to us, I want to give you guys the background of the book of Ephesians. Because for us to understand the message that we are about to read, it is very important that we understand the background of the book so that it forms the context for which we can understand why Paul wrote the way he wrote. Amen? The first thing that we need to know is that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians while he was in prison in Rome. Are we together? So every time you begin to read scripture and you imagine that Paul was in prison when writing this, then you get to understand that the Christian faith or the Christian calling is not just a simple calling. It is a deep calling because even in times of crisis, we are still supposed to retain our faith. So Paul writes while in prison, and he writes to the church of, where, where, which church does he write to? Writes to the church of Ephesus. Now a few things about Ephesus. Number one, Ephesus was one of the major cities of a place called Minor Asia. And Ephesus was a very big city. It, it used to be a commercial city. There used to be a lot of business that was transacted at Ephesus. But one thing stood tall in Ephesus, and that is why Paul, in really writing to the church of Ephesus, has to give them meat. Why? Because the church of Ephesus was in Ephesus at a time where there used to be a temple for a goddess that used to be worshipped who was called Artemis. Tell your neighbor Artemis. Or, uh, or also called Diana. So there used to be a lot of pagan worship. People used to worship idols, and specifically, they used to worship the goddess Artemis. You can imagine, it is in this same town of Ephesus that in the book of Acts tells us that a man called Demetrius, have you ever, guy, have you ever heard about a man called Demetrius? Hello? Manasomanga Bible. 
Mshaisikia jamaa anaitwa Demetrius. There's a guy called Demetrius who used to uh, make business by selling small artifacts from the temple of Artemis. And well Paul went to Ephesus and began to preach the gospel and people began to convert to Christianity, he lost business. Hello. That tells me that sometimes there are people who will lose business when other people get saved. But this guy called Demetrius plans a revolt against Paul. But guess what? The gospel still prevails in Ephesus. Now say the last thing, then we can go and read the scripture. If you've uh, read uh, scripture well, you realize that most of the letters that Paul writes to specific churches, he's either addressing an error, he's addressing a heresy, or he's addressing something that needs to be addressed because the people had gone out of the way. If you look at the book of Corinth, that was lit, uh, the, the book of Corinthians that was written to the church at Corinth, there's a lot of things that are being addressed in that book. You know, he writes and talks about um, that Christians should not take one another to court. He writes and tells them, you, you, got, you guys, let's talk about the body of Christ. We should not be divided because of gifts. But when he writes to the church of Ephesus, he writes to empower them, encourage them in the things of the Lord. So this letter is not written to address error or heresy. It is written to encourage and build up the church. Tell your neighbor, encourage and build up the church. Let's go to uh, our scripture in context, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 24. Give me the amplified version. All right, so we're going to read together. So one, two, three, go, let's read. That you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility of their minds and in the fullness of their souls. For their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is clouded. They are alienated and self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is deep-seated within them because of the hardness and insensitivity of their heart. And they, the ungodly in their spiritual apathy, having become callous and unfeeling, have given themselves over as prey to unbridled sensuality, eagerly craving the practice of every kind of impurity that their desires may demand. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If in fact you have really heard uh -huh, and have been taught by him, just as the truth is in Jesus, revealed in his life and personified in him, that regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self, completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. And put on the new self, the regenerated and renewed nature, Created in God's image, God-like, in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for salvation. Bonasifiwe. I want to speak briefly to you on the message I call blind understanding. Blind understanding. Blind understanding. And I know sometimes as, as a Christian, you have to ask yourself, or you've ever gotten to this place where you ask yourself, how is it that there are some people that don't realize that they need God? And in so doing, they look like they don't have anything to do with him. They're doing their things. 
and wao wakikuangalia wewe unakaa kama wewe ndio fala are we together lakini wewe ukiwaangalia unaona kweli wao ndio mafala because this is the thing when unbelievers look at us they think we are stupid and when we look at them we look at them and see what is why is it that you're not getting this thing why is it that you're not understanding that you are the one who needs salvation i've done uh, quite a number of high school ministry and over time i've realized that people don't see things the way we see them and that is why as a christian it is mandated of you to make sure that other people see the light no one's you know when people are doing uh, error when people are doing wrong things they don't get that they are doing wrong things when you tell them they are doing wrong they think you're condemning them but they don't get the fact that they're in a, in a mess why because something has happened to them that does not cause them to see that which you're seeing the way you're seeing it hello hello ama tuongeeni haujaiona mtu mwenye jokoka then you look at this guy and you're thinking why is it that you don't get the fact that you need to be saved why is it that you don't get the fact that what you're doing is wrong and i and I, 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 over a long time i realized that by the way the problem is not me or them the problem is what they have been subjected to are we together because the bible begins by telling us in verse 17 that they they the gentiles or these people who are unbelievers they live in the futility of their thinking they are darkened in their understanding and they are separated from the life of god because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts so the first thing is they harden their hearts and hardening their hearts cause them to come to a place where their understanding is darkened so because their understanding is darkened they cannot see the light even when you tell them about the light Hello. Hello. And I want really to constrict myself to the book of Ephesians in this uh, few minutes that I have. But let us go to the, the uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. Ephesians 2. And it says and you he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. Verse 2 in which you once walked you are following the ways of this world influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince of the power of the air the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient or the children of disobedience the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of god just uh, pause it there listen The reason why unbelievers don't see or realize the fact that they are messed up the fact that they are choosing the wrong things is because there is a darkening that has come in their understanding and they cannot conceive the light are we together basically these guys cannot get the fact that they are the ones who are in a mess and that is why sometimes we do not explain to them the light we are to shine forth to them the light because if they can't understand it even though we try to explain it they will not get it so the only thing we can do is to actually show them the light then they can comprehend are we together so paul is telling us in the book of ephesians that even you and i when we were not born again we were like them are we together Now for most of you who have had an experience with being unsaved you realize or right now you can look back at your old self and ask yourself what was wrong with me then are we together if you be, if you've been saved for some time and you are unsaved for some other time when you look back at your unsaved version you're like hey boss niaje huko meget is if you meget sai why because it seems as though when you are unsaved there are a lot of things that you did not perceive are we together and that's why paul tells us that then even us we walked in darkness under the power of the prince of the air but guess what when you and i saw the light we stopped walking under his cause 
Verse 1 tells us that but when you, when you are spiritually dead, tell your neighbor spiritually dead, there are three kinds of death. Number one is natural death. Natural death. What is natural death? Natural death is dying. Yani ni kugenya. Kukua lifeless. You've just died. Are we together? Natural death is when you are absent from the, from the body. Number two, we have spiritually or spiritual death. Spiritual death is when you are disconnected from God and your spirit is dead. We have natural death. Natural death is when your soul and your spirit are absent from the body. Spiritual death is when your spirit is disconnected from God and it is dead. Hello? Hello? Then we have death number three. Death number three is eternal death. Tell me about eternal death. And eternal death is when a spiritually dead person dies naturally. What do I mean? It is when you die without having received Jesus as your personal savior. And let me tell you, this is the worst form of death that a man can ever die. Because there is no hope for a man that dies eternally. There is hope for a man that dies spiritually because when he accepts Christ, the spirit of resurrection, the spirit of regeneration comes upon him and gives his spirit life. When a man dies naturally, if there is a man of faith, that man can be raised from the dead. But when a man dies without having received Jesus, uh, there's a problem with that man. And that is why the Bible begins to tell me that when you and I, who are alive in Christ, when we die, we are not dead. We are just sleeping. Hello? Now ask your neighbor, are you going to sleep or are you going to die? Because those who sleep, there is hope for them. But those who die, oh, my friend, they are going to die again. Because when this time ends, they are going to face another fire that will, will kill them all over again. Amen? So now, it is important then for us to understand that unbelievers don't see the light because their eyes of their understanding, they are darkened and that is why they cannot perceive the things that we perceive. And let me say this, it is important for us to understand this why because when we come to church, the part of you that senses God, the part of you that is alive in worship is your spirit. So if, when it is time for worship and you cannot feel God, then most probably you are dead. And it is a sad reality for us to note that there are many spiritually dead people in church. Hello? Hello? You see, what happens when you're spiritually dead is you go with the flow. You go with the trend. But when you are alive in Christ, you go by the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Are we together? Listen, a man exists in three. Are we together? Or the constitution of a man is in three. Now, man is a spirit who has a soul and lives in a body. Repeat that with me. Man is a, that has a, and lives in a, man is a, that lives, uh, that has a, and lives in a, let me, let me begin to break down these three parts so that we can understand. Now, number one, your spirit gives you God's consciousness. Tell your neighbor, your spirit gives you God's consciousness. Now, what does that mean? It means that it is your spirit that senses God. Are we together? See, when the worship leader is leading worship and he says, ah, oh, the spirit of God is here, the part of them that has discerned the presence is the spirit. So if your spirit is dead, then you cannot sense God. Hello? Hello? Can you ask your neighbor if uh, their spirit is alive? Are we together? You know, uh, 
We are young people, and sometimes it's good to, for us to ask ourselves a, a number of questions. And then I ask this question and say, why, why is it that there are some people, when they are worshipping, they cry? Why is it that when some people are worshipping, they, 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 they cannot stand the glory of God? They, they kneel, they lie prostrate on the, on, on the ground. They move in, in different ways to, to reflect what they have received. It's because their spirit senses God. And when your spirit can sense God, uh, there is nothing that you cannot do. It is when your spirit is alive and you can sense that God is in this meeting that you can do anything in your power just to show him of your love for him. Hello? But there are some, some people, well, they are not in this church or they are not in this conference. It is worship time. My friend, the worship leader, Akopahali Amefika, you lift your hands at an angle theater. And you bend your head at an angle beater and you're just there. And some of you are in church. You're on Facebook. Nani time you worship. Mtu wangu. Ukiona mtu kama uyo muambie next time you are spiritually dead. Are we together? Because how can we explain we are in church. We are at a time where God is ministering to his people. And some people are sleeping in church. Those are spiritually dead people. Bona sifiwe. Hello. Ask your neighbor, are you spiritually dead? Are we together? So it is your spirit that gives you a consciousness of God. Are we together? Let me tell you, young people in our generation have many questions. They ask us, how does God speak to us? You know, because every pastor seems to come and tell me, you know, God spoke to me. How does God speak to people? And uh, let me tell you the truth. If your spirit is dead, God cannot speak to you because you cannot hear. Are we together? Each and every one of the physical senses of man exist in the spirit. Hello? Hello? I'm going to show you something. Uh, so let me not go ahead of myself. But you, the spirit gives you God's consciousness. Number two, the body. All right, let's go to the soul first. The soul gives you self-consciousness. The soul gives you the soul gives you what? Self-consciousness. It gives you an awareness of, your, of yourself. Are we together? It is your soul that is telling you right now, you are in Deliverance Church, Kasarani Zimmerman. Are we together? It is your soul that in a few minutes or in a few hours will tell you you are hungry. You are tired. Why? It is your soul that connects to tell you what you feel, what you know, and what you decide. Now, write this down. Your soul has three components. Your soul has three components. Your soul has the mind, the heart, and the will. It has the mind, the heart, and the, and the will. Your soul has the mind, the heart, and the, and the will. Now, let me tell you. We don't win souls. We win spirits. Ah, we don't win spirits. We win souls. Are we together? You know, I, I ask myself this question some time back and I ask, why is it that we win souls and not spirits? Because if I can win your soul, I can control your life. Are we together? Because the first thing that happened to you when you gave your life to Christ is your spirit was made alive. But guess what? Your soul, your soul still needed to be saved. Are we together? Then the last is the body. The body gives you World's consciousness. The body gives you world's consciousness. See, it is the body that came from the earth that connects you to the earth and makes you feel things that are only limited to the earth. It's the body that will tell you you're hungry. It's the body that will tell you that you're tired. Are we together? So your body senses things in the earthly realm. Are we together? So... Soul, spirit, body. Now listen. Paul writes and says that these Gentiles, their understanding is darkened. Now listen. The mind is in the soul. But guess what? If there is a problem or there is a disconnect between the spirit and the soul, there is no relay of information. 
Are we together? Are we together? Listen. When you get born again, something happens. In fact, let me ask you this. Most of you, when you got born again, you never felt anything major. Au kuwai tetemeka, sinyo kweli? Au kusikia kulia, wewe tulio, ulikuja tu, pastor, I feel I need to get born again. And you gave your life to Christ. After that, you went back, not the same person, but feeling like the same person. But over time, something began to happen. When you sin, something tells you what you have done is wrong. That's what we call a consciousness. Now, consciousness is something that is activated by your spirit. So if your spirit is dead, you don't have a consciousness. Are we together? When your spirit is dead, you don't have a consciousness. You don't have a realization that what I am doing is wrong. That is why you will go ahead and do it because nothing tells you that what you are doing is wrong. But if you are saved, something convicts you and tells you, my friend, that's not your direction. See, when an unbeliever sins, they don't sin against their nature. They sin in their nature. That's why they don't feel bad. But a Christian receives a new nature. That is why when you sin, you sin against your nature. Bwana sifiwe. Hakuna mtu hapa ashaiona ngombe ikikula chipo. Why because it's against the nature of the cow to feed on fries. Bwana sifiwe. The next time you ever see a cow feeding on 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 fries, you can you can backslide. But if you've never seen a cow feed on fries, then it tells you that it cannot do against its nature. Are we together? That is why when you sin, you sin against your nature. That's why you feel wrong. But an unbeliever, it is in their nature to sin. Are we together? So let's just continue. So then, Paul says that however, it's not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ... And were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You are taught with regard to your former way of life. To put off your old self. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Uh, and to be made new in the attitude of your mind. Let me tell you, I said something here. When you get born again, the first part of you that gets born again. Or that gets activated is your spirit. Are we together? The first part of it that becomes alive is your spirit. Now, if you're writing down, write this down. There are three tenses of salvation. There are three tenses of salvation. There is you were saved, you are being saved, then you will be saved. What did I say? You were saved. Number two. You are being saved. Number three, you will be saved. So that tells me that when I came to the altar and I said that prayer that people say, that sometimes it's very interesting because we make God our secretary and we assume there are books in heaven that God's only work is to rub and write. Bona sifiwe. Bona yesu. Futa jina langu kwa kitabu cha. Chamauti. Where does the Bible speak about a book of death? Because sometimes we, we say some very interesting things. There's no book of death. There's only the book of life. And then other books. So, okay, you've come. You've said the prayer. You believed something has happened to you. Then you go back. What has happened? Your spirit has been made alive. Are we together? So just because you said a prayer does not mean that you are saved. Hello? I want to make this interesting. You know, because most of us have believed more in a prayer than in the power of God to keep us saved. Hello? Be just because you say the prayer does not mean that you are saved. It means you have begun the process and the journey of salvation. And if you don't complete the journey, then you don't get to the destination. Hello? Come on, talk up on Natao. Have you gotten to your destination? But when you left here, you had purpose to get to town. So when you come and say that prayer, you come to a realization 
and you pledge yourself into the work of salvation. But if you are light before getting to the destination, you have not arrived. That's why it is not just enough to give your life to Christ. You have begun the process of walking in salvation until you get to that place where you will be saved. Are we together? The first thing that happens is what we call justification. Tell me about justification. My friends, if you can understand biology and, and chemistry uh, and the high things of university, you can understand justification. What is justification? Justification is the term that says just as if you've never sinned. Hello? So yesterday I was a sinner, you know, I was doing my things. Then today I come to the conference and I say, you know what? I, I want to give my life to Christ. So what have I done? Today when I make that prayer, my sins have been forgiven. Are we together? But justification is just the entrance into salvation. Because after justification, you need to get to a place called sanctification. Are we together? Now what is sanctification? Sanctification is the process of being made holy. Tell your neighbor, being made holy. It means today I take a step in holiness. Tomorrow I take another step into holiness. The day after that I take another step into holiness. And I walk until I get into perfect holiness. I want to say this. There are many Christians that live in a dimension called self-pity. Why? Because you sin then you repent, then you sin again, and you get to a place and you tell yourself, I think I'm going to give up with this salvation thing because I'm not getting any better at it. But guess what? The Bible tells me that, guess what? Put on that new man daily because the old man is growing in deceitful desires. So that's why I have to keep on walking. Uh, when I fall down in sin, I rise up again. Why? Because, listen, you cannot make yourself holy. People have tried. The Old Testament is a proof of people that have tried to keep themselves holy. My friend, the more you try to make sure you don't fall into sin, the more you actually fall into sin. That is why you come into the place and you tell God, Jesus, you know what? Uh, when I said that, that prayer, I, I, I said, I entrust my life to you to help me. So if you can help me, then I can become. But if you don't help me, I won't become. So sanctification is daily presenting yourself to Jesus to make you holy and to help you become a better person. Are we together? Then as you continually walk in sanctification, you get to a level. We will get to that level. It's called glorification. Tell anybody about glorification. This is the realm of glory. This is where the Bible says, when we see him, who Jesus, we shall be like he is. Your body will be translated to another body. Let me tell you guys, the only reason why we sin is number one, because we are still living in a world of sin. Are we together? Say you go church, and you know you're in a holy place, and you feel very holy. Kesho and utoke when kai home na mabeshte wako wako wapu base. To realize, I am not that holy. Are we together? Because the world is in consistent growth of sin. That's why we have to also consistent, cons, consistently grow the light. Are we together? Hello? Mnanishika? So this sanctification thing is a daily thing. And that's why Paul writes and says, put on the new man. Now let me explain something about the new man. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creation, the old is, and the new has come. Now, let me explain something. When you, when you get first, when you get 2 Corinthians 5, says, the old is gone, the new has come. You are a new creature. Tell your neighbor, that new creature is a new species that has never been seen before. Are we together? So when you gave your life to Christ, what, what happened? Something came upon you. It transformed you, made you a new person that even you do not know. Are we together? So how 
do I come to the knowledge of this new thing that I have become? When I read the scriptures, that is all about the new creation. Because let me listen to me, guys. The new man in you has the righteousness you need, but we are still working to become more righteous. Hello? Let me say something. And write this down, meditate upon it later. We do not become more righteous. We only become more righteous conscious. Are we together? We don't become any more righteous. We only become more righteous conscious. Yani, there is an awareness in you of righteousness that makes you exhibit the righteousness you have already received. My friends, when you gave your life to Christ, what happened is God in one package gave you everything you needed for life. See, Ephesians is a very interesting book because it begins by telling me that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So guess what? I am not waiting for any more blessing. I have been blessed with everything. My friend, you've been blessed with everything. But guess what? These blessings are spiritual and are accessed in the spiritual realm. Are we together? Then Paul continues to write and say, let's read this because it's very interesting. As I bring this thing to a close. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15. Let's begin from verse 15. Ephesians 1 15. It says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. Verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Verse 17, I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you not cars, not good grades, but a spirit of wisdom and revelation. What are the things that you guys pray for? Because we have become so materialistic even in our prayer. Hello? We ask God to bless us. We ask God to bless our family. We ask God to give us good grades. We ask God to make sure we marry the right people. We ask God for many things. But guess what? There are better things to pray for than those ones. I'm not saying that praying for those things is bad. It is good because it, the Bible tells us to pray for them. But guess what? We need to raise a generation of people that pray for such things. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Let me tell you, if you get the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you can get everything. Are we together? So let's just go back there. I pray to God to give you the spirit of wisdom. Uh, I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you the, not a, the spirit of wisdom and revelation mm, into the true knowledge of him. Let me tell you the truth. We do not know Jesus Christ the way we are supposed to know him. I like the fact that your theme is the walk. I like the fact that I was told to come and talk about one standard. But let me tell you the truth. We can never enter this one standard if we don't come into one knowledge of Jesus. There are things that as the body of Christ, as believers, we are supposed to come into. Number one. One spirit. First thing, one spirit. And let me tell you, when you give your life to Christ and the Holy Ghost comes upon you, the Holy Ghost baptizes you into the body. Now that baptism is because of one spirit. If I told you receive the Holy Spirit, because there are other people that receive other spirits. One as if you were. So one spirit, that's the first thing as the body of Christ we need to have. Then after one spirit, we can have one knowledge of Jesus. The unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Very important thing. Number three, we need to enter into a level we call one faith. If this conference, we brought some cripples here. Half of this congregation would believe that that cripple can walk. The other half would be like, because I don't have my own personal belief that that can happen. But guess what? 
God intends that you and I can believe in the same way. Because if you can believe in the same way, we can achieve the same results. So one spirit, one knowledge of Jesus, one faith, uh, nothing called one purpose. Are we together? Let me tell you, different people here have different purposes. But guess what? God intends for us to come into something we call one purpose. Because that's the reason why he saved you and me. Let me ask you this question. As I become more real with you. Why do you think of all people in the whole world, God saved you? In fact, not, not any one of you here went and told God, God, I want to be saved. None of you asked for salvation. But guess what? He purposed in himself to give you and me salvation that we never asked for. Look at this picture. So God is in heaven. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to make man. So he makes man in his image. And he purposes that this man will walk in righteousness and fulfill his purposes. Then the devil comes in and makes the man fall. So the man falls and God, without consulting anyone, puts up Jesus to be crucified because of the sake of this man. And because of Jesus, this man can be reunited back to God. But guess what? Right now, the average population of the world tells us we are at 7 billion. And of those 7 billion, at least 1 or 2 billion of them are Christians. But guess what? Why did God choose you? Because most of us think that we, when we came to the altar, we chose God. But guess what? You can never choose God before he chooses you. Mtu wangu, sio wewe ulikuja ukasema nataka kuokoka. Mungu ali ku choose then aka make sure umesikia gospel. Venye ulisikia gospel, kitu ika ku show leo ndio siku yangu ya kuokoka. Without God choosing you, you would still not be saved. Let me tell you, darkness is powerful until there is entrance of light. Hello? When you go into your room at night, it is so dark. You can't see anything. You can't even walk. But when there is light, it doesn't even matter. The intensity of the darkness, light will shine. That is why you never chose God. He chose you. Mtu wangu siyo wewe li sema mungu nataka kwa koka leo. Zi, ni ye ya liku choose. After liku choose, ukasikia gospel, ukasema leo nataka kwa koka. Are we together? So then we have to ask ourselves the question, why me? Why you? Why you? Of all the people in this world, why you? Hello? Hello? And for us to understand why me, then we must understand what is the plan and the purpose of God. So let's continue to read. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation into the true knowledge of him. Verse 18. Ah... Uh, and I pray that the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your understanding, give me back in the New King James Version. And I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Now, I said something here when I began. The unbelievers, their understanding is darkened. That's why I called it blind understanding. But guess what? As a Christian, there is an understanding we need to have. Hello? As a Christian, there is an understanding we need to have. And this understanding is in the eyes. And these eyes are not these ones. They are the ones in the spirit. That's why we have Christians that have an understanding, but their understanding is blind. That's why they cannot perceive the things of God. Hello? 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 Just give me that scripture. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? I want to just hold it on, on the screen. I want to explain something in this scripture then we're going to pray and we're going to bring this to a close. Are we together? Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. You want enlightened, ni shed light on a matter. 
Sinukweli. Now, how many of us have ever read the Bible, but we don't understand what the Bible says, but we've read it? Because many times when we read the Bible, we get something we call knowledge. But when God seeks that you get something more than that knowledge, God seeks that when you read the scripture, you get something we call revelation. You get something called enlightenment. And this enlightenment cannot be got by a person who is spiritually dead. Because what can make the difference between you and somebody who is not saved? Hello? Muslims, they do read the Bible. But guess what? They cannot get revelation. They will only get knowledge. But you as a Christian, you need to get something we call revelation. But guess what? We still read the Bible and we get knowledge, no revelation. There's a problem. There's a disconnect. Why? Because the eyes of your understanding are still in darkness. So Paul writes and says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding, that they may be enlightened, that they may be opened to see the light, so that when you can see the light, then you can understand what is the hope of his calling. I said something here important. It is not us that chose God. It is God that chose us in him even before the world was created. That's what we call the hope of all glory, the hope of his calling. He's the one who called you. Bible says in the book of Romans that for those whom he foreknew, he also justified. So if God knew you before, he already made a plan for you to walk in righteousness. Hello? Listen, the reason why God called you is because even before he called you, he had already prepared a way for you. Let me tell you, we did not come to a Jesus or to a God that has not yet prepared for us the way. We did not come to a God that has not given us everything we need for righteousness. Mdwangu, Yesu anayanza keep kwa salvation. But most of us, we have not yet believed that he can keep us in salvation. That's why he says, I pray that the hope that your eyes being opened, you may understand the hope of his calling, number one. Number two, that the riches of his glory, of the inheritance in the saints. Listen, God is not just full of glory. He is rich in glory. But that glory is in the inheritance that he has in the saints. Who are the saints? They are you and I who believe in Jesus, who walk in Jesus, and will become like Jesus. Those are the saints. So the more the saints, the more the inheritance, the more the riches of his glory. Hello? Hello? That's why, after having conferences like this, we go out there and we win souls. Why? Because we understand, the more the people that come to the light of Jesus, the more God is glorified. Let me tell you the truth. God does not have a problem with shining his glory upon you. He only requires that you shine it back to him. Hello? Let me tell you the truth. God can raise people in this church, in this congregation, that are going to be voices, that are going to be pillars, that are going to do great things for him. But guess what? You must first present yourself and tell God, you know what? I'm ready to live for your glory. Come on, let's just rise up to our feet. I want us to pray one simple prayer. And this is the prayer I want us to pray. I want you to, you're going to make this prayer for yourself. Are we together? I want you to pray that God will open the eyes of your understanding, that you'll begin to understand things. Are we together? Let me tell you the truth. Are we together? Let me tell you the truth. Are we together? Let me tell you the truth. Are we together? Let me tell you the truth. Why? Because there are a lot of things that Christians we need to know so that we can overcome the world. Are we together? There are a lot of things as Christians we need to know so that we can become who God has called us to be. But we cannot come to the knowledge of these things without our eyes first being opened. I want you to begin to pray for yourself. If you can pray in tongues, just begin to pray in tongues. But pray. Ask God, God, 
Here I am. Open my eyes. Begin to pray that prayer. Begin to pray that prayer. Begin to pray that prayer. Ask him, ask him. Father, open my eyes. Open the eyes of my understanding. I want to begin to understand scripture. I want to begin to understand how to function in this world. I want to begin to understand why is it that you saved me. I want to begin to understand what is it that you require of me. Because I tell you the truth. If we were only saved for heaven, you could get saved and be raptured. But the reason was to why you're still on this earth is because God has a purpose for you. So if you can raise up our mouths and begin to ask him for illumination begin to ask him for enlightenment I tell you the truth we will begin to function in realms of knowledge we begin to function in realms of glory because God seeks that he may increase you with his glory but it is upon you to pray that the eyes of your understanding be opened that the eyes of your understanding your spiritual sight may be opened that you may begin to see the light that you may begin to see the light open your mouth and begin to pray that God may open your sight that you may begin to see the things that you for you could not see that you may begin to understand scripture in different ways that you will begin to behold what is his glory what are the riches what is his inheritance that is in you because as you grow that inheritance grows as we win souls that inheritance increases I tell you the truth the only way we can be sustained in our walk with God is if our sight is open. When Haggai was in the wilderness with his son, with her son, God opened her eyes. And it is when God opened her eyes that she saw the well. So it means the well was there. But because her sight could not perceive the well. She could not get the water that she needed for life. So if we can pray that our eyes are opened. We will find. We will soon realize that everything that we need for life. God has granted it to us. Just lift up your hands. Just lift up your hands. Father, I thank you for the counsel of your word. I thank you, O oh Lord, because your word is life. And I pray, O oh God, that you may open the eyes of their understanding. That these eyes shall begin to be enlightened. That we shall not leave us Christians that have a blind understanding. We shall not leave us Christians that are darkened in their understanding. But our eyes shall be opened that we can see what is the hope of the glory. What is the hope of the glory? Why is it that you saved us? Why is it that we are on this earth? That we shall begin to function in heightened states of revelation. I pray over these ones, oh God, that when they read the Bible, you shall give them revelation. I pray that the same spirit that you gave to me of the understanding of the word, that you shall be with them, that they shall understand the word and their lives shall forever be translated. I pray and subject them into the counsel of the Holy Ghost. He that teaches us all things, he that openeth to us that which Jesus taught that as Christians we shall no longer live as the world lives but we shall live with a different standard with one standard that oh God we shall truly live for your glory I pray oh God that you shall cause them to stumble upon scriptures that shall begin to open to them the counsel of God that is hidden in the word that from today their lives shall never be the same again. Come on, just begin to uh, give a clap offering to Jesus. I said, give a clap offering to Jesus.